recording for now. Once again, welcome to this event. The Historic Districts Council, as you may know, is New York City's advocate for historic buildings and places. And today we have a very special event. We're gonna be talking about the movie In the Heights. And we are fortunate to have the, the movie's location, location manager, Samson Jacobson and Angel Ayon, who is a uh, preservation architect. Samson, he, he's, a, he's been a location manager for different projects and he's a native New Yorker and he's gonna be talking about the process of finding places that are relevant to the community, this process of working with elected officials and different groups to make this successful. And Angel is gonna be leading the discussion with, with Samson. So thank you so much, everyone for attending. And um, Angel, you can take it from here. Like stopping watching two nights. <laughs> um, thank you, uh, Historic District Council, to for having me uh, here today. This is this is a fun event that I'm really delighted to to be part of. Um, and thank you, Samson, for for joining me uh, on this this little experiment to talk about culture and and preservation um, uh, while talking about a movie or or the other way around. So. Um, I just want to start by just talking about how, how do I how do I get involved with the movie? What's my relationship to the movie? I think I think I I, I we were uh, my family we were at, at some friend at our friends uh, upstate and um, uh, our friends uh, our friend have kids who are really close to to, to our daughter and um, in the middle of the night then they say well let's just watch a movie there's this big screen. Um, and started rolling this movie in the heights that I had never heard of. And I, I watched the movie and uh, I loved it. I mean, it was a movie about immigrants from the Caribbean, people with uh, an accent like mine, uh, with their, their inability to, to speak um, uh, English uh, and, uh, and uh, like mine sometimes. And, and the love and the passion for New York and the same kind of struggles and, and sense of, of wondering about who, who you are, where you're coming from, where you're going, how do you belong and what does it really mean? So it spoke very, very personally to me um, uh, uh, and, and my experience as, as an immigrant um, in, in New York. And, and, and I found it to be also some kind of an uh, ode to New York as well. And I, think it was just, I thought it was just really a, a beautiful movie for full of poetry, but also full of yes. um, 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 a lot of really important conversations about, about uh, immigration, personal experience, like sense of place and so on. So, so um, uh, Samson, I, 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 you, you had a, a unique uh, involvement with, with the movie. You, you are the, the, the location manager. You, what's, what was your job? What was the ask? Did they, did they, did they, did they ask you to find a specific place or that looked like something specifically? Did you have a sense knowing the, the script uh, and the screenplay of what you want to show or what you didn't want to show? Like what, what was your job? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, well, first, thank you for having me for this. Um, Diego, Lorna, Angel, I'm, I'm really, it's nice to be here and to talk about um, this project because it is a defining project of my career um, for many reasons, primarily because I'm from Washington Heights and I thought it was, I took on the Herculean effort or task uh, to make sure that the neighborhood was re represented um, as it actually exists. And so my role as the location manager for any of these projects that I work on is, is to sit down and have a conversation with the producers and the director and, and understand what it is that they envision and then try to go out and find what they're thinking of and what they're hoping for. Um, there was a very distinct um, task at hand at the beginning of this, which is, this is a movie about Washington Heights. This can only take place in Washington Heights and no place else. There's, you know, in the 90s and the early 2000s and even the 80s, New York movies were taken to Canada, 
Montreal, Toronto, wherever else it was cheap to make it New York look like New York. Uh, since the tax incentive has come about and been strongly uh, driving the, this industry for the last 15 years, it's made it easier for filmmakers to come here and say, I want to shoot New York. And so Warner Brothers really, really bought into Lynn's vision of this original uh, Broadway musical, which won a ton of Tonys and was a widely regarded play uh, musical on Broadway. So they, they took it very seriously about saying, we want to be in the neighborhood and we want to work with the neighborhood and the community to try and deliver that. Um, and so the initial conversation with me was about how do we get in with everybody and how do we make it so that the neighborhood wants us? Because as some of the folks here may be familiar with, you may have run in, into a film set, you might park your car on the street, and we might ask you to move and you might not like that. In general, those are the little annoyances that we deal with, but the goal was how to make this movie about the community, in the community, and make sure that everybody bought into it. So a lot of that was about meeting with everybody who ostensibly represented the community, whether it was politicians, uh, local organizers, the list goes on and on. The whole mission at hand was essentially, the short of it was to create a um, do the right thing kind of block. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with Do the Right Thing, Spike Lee's, you know, first movie, his, his opus. Um, the whole movie takes place around one block. We really wanted to make sure that what we were going to find here was going to be a centralized block to represent the entire community. And so that's what I was tasked with, and that's what I'm tasked with on a lot of these projects. Wow. And how, how did the community react? And I mean, you guys were, uh, I, when we used to live in Harlem and our block was beautiful block on 121st Street, there were movies there all the time. So I know exactly how, how, how bad of a nightmare it is for the movie being shot on, uh, on your block. But uh, how did the community react? How This is not a place where lots of movies are shot. A lot of movies in New York are actually shot downtown. This is this may have been, I, I would imagine, a little bit of a surprise for people that, that you were there. Um, and and okay, how did people react? You know, it's a big thing. I think for the most part, people were actually happy about the effort put in for communication so far in advance. In general, um, successful filmmaking in neighborhoods comes from a sort of grassroots organizing effort. And it's a combination of door knocking and going to community board meetings and discussing the overall project with, with people. Uh, I had no pushback from anybody. In fact, the only pushback I received was local residents being adamant that the neighborhood was represented uh, in the positive light that it is. You know, I think there there was concern, there's always concern when movies come along, right? Because there's this uh, penchant for Hollywood to over dramatize certain situations and play on nefarious things like uh, crime or something that's not necessarily family friendly. And really that was the main concern I ever faced was that people wanted to make sure that this was represented well. The local immigrant community was not familiar within the Heights. I mean, that, that was what I found across the board is that people know who Lin-Manuel Miranda is, but at the same time, in the Heights, this isn't the, a community that necessarily, quite frankly, can afford to go to Broadway shows. A lot of people are working two, three jobs. So when I tell them I'm making a movie about them, you know, they're a little incredulous at first. And once they heard me explain really what the heart of the project was, um, they were easily swayed and on board. And, you know, the really heartwarming thing about shooting, especially in this neighborhood, is there's a real sense of community all the time. You know, if it's Friday night at midnight or 1 a.m., there's groups of family members, of friends, 
sitting on their chairs, hanging out and enjoying the summer. And so essentially while we were filming, we were also having like the regular normal community hangout. And so it was very much a hand in hand experience. So even though initially there was some pushback and concern about the proper representation, I think the ultimate experience was a, a positive one uh, because the community was able to see themselves being represented on film and then had the chance to eventually be able to see the final product and say, hey, that's my block. So I think overall, uh, it was a positive experience from start to finish. Amazing. Um, it, it must have been just thrilling to, to be in the middle of, see your block and to transform into a, a movie theater and into a movie uh, 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 scene. Uh, can, can we just talk about this part that, that is being displayed here? This is the, uh, the I think eventually this place is going to be called like in, like in the Heights Corner, the uh, 175th Street and uh, Alabama Avenue. Why, why there? Why, why there? This is, it's an amazing spot. And it's this photo of kind of shows who's now this bodega on the left hand. And then um, I think there's a pharmacy, but diagonal to that, that is uh, the, the car service um, 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 uh, and uh, uh, Kevin Rosario's ca cast, uh, ca car service. But in reality, there is also an, a real bodega and a real <laughs> car service on that, on that corner. Why, why this corner? Why, how did you end up picking this spot? I mean, we knew the, the script called for um, certain components of a bodega, diagonally or across from a car service because there is so much interplay and it's, uh, view changing between both locations. So she called for that originally. And so when I did the first preliminary survey in November of 2018, I, I went up and down I mean, look, there's, there's only so much geography in Washington Heights, right? So you go up and down Audubon. Uh, to me, this movie had to be made. If you're a resident of Washington Heights, you know that there's essentially two sides of Washington Heights. There's um, the side east of Broadway and the side of west of Broadway. Uh, this movie had to be on the east side of Broadway because that's where it belonged. That's the neighborhood it was represented. I'm from the west side of Broadway, so I know the differences in the neighborhoods and everything like that. The, the survey essentially, when I got to this block and this intersection, I, in location, we have spidey sense. You know, we know when, when something's gonna work and, and it hits just right. And I think actually, if anybody has the time to do it, if you go up and down Audubon or even Amsterdam, there's this weird camera obscura with the George Washington Bridge where I can't quite really describe the feeling of looking up the block and the bridge feels larger than life at certain points. And it shouldn't because you're really far away from it. But all of that, Audubon, Amsterdam, it was impossible to get away from. And it's the anchor point of everything in Washington Heights. It is this magnificent specimen, structural specimen that draws us all to that neighborhood. Um, so when I got to this intersection, knowing that we wanted to have, like you see here, a hundred dancers in the middle of it, I think at one point, the director, John, John M. Chu said to me, he wanted 500 dancers in, in the intersection and wow. I, I, the budget just couldn't handle that <laughs> many dancers. Um, but knowing that this intersection had the space, the sidewalks were extra wide. When you stand there, it really actually is, it, it is a movie set. There's something about it that no other intersection had in that neighborhood. And then combined with essentially what you and I have talked about previously, the hodgepodge of architecture that defines Washington Heights you can stand on every corner and opposite from that corner is a different view of a type of building that represents what was built up there. And to me, when you see that kind of variety and you see depth and you see the George Washington Bridge down on 175th, 
all of these elements combined with actually having uh, a car service and a bodega diagonally across. I said to myself, if this isn't the location, I'm on the wrong job. And I even sort of had to have a fight, not a fight, but like I pushed hard for it because the director saw what I saw. And there was like, at first there was, you know, hand wringing about maybe trying to take it to a different intersection. But once you've seen the movie and you see how it all plays out, there's no way this could have been shot anywhere else. This is a cinematic spot, uh, but it's also, it's a real thing. It's legit. It, it, it looks legit and it is legit because it's really in, 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 in the heart of El Barrio. So it's, it's, and, and it had apparently all, all the things you were looking for. I'm not sure you could fit 500 people there. You may have to go to Times Square for that one. But uh, it's, it's a really amazing spot. Um, oh, really actually, and I'm sorry to even say this, but you see this in the slide, and this is a, a, a Google Street View image, that bottom slide of the bodega. Mm -hmm. That mural on the side of the bodega, right. that's a mural with, that we painted. And the neighborhood was so happy about having it. There was one guy that came out of nowhere and said to me, he said, if anybody tags this, I'm going to make it their worst day. And he <laughs> like, they kept it. They wanted to keep it. So it's nice to see this like Google Street View image that it's still there and it's still pristine. I thought I thought actually I thought that it was there and then you just kind of embrace it. Um, um, I, I think it's just an amazing spot because of what you said. It, it, it's it just shows that variety of different building topologies and so on, the businesses and so on. Um, can, can we talk about the, the, the specifics? Let's, let's, just, let's just talk about Usnavi's uh, bodega. You, there was a bodega there. Um, I don't know if you know this guy in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but there was a, a real bodega there. What, what do you have to do? And why, why did you have to kind of dress it up uh, with a new awning and so on? Or what did you change and what you didn't have to change? You know, the, and this is where we get into the Hollywood uh, dramatics of things, right? The production designer was from California and had sort of a, 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 an image of New York that I think was married to the 80s. You know, you and I being in the city as long as we have, we remember those colors of awnings and the bodega front that, that is this awning. It's been slowly or quickly wiped out where that doesn't really exist anymore. Um, and so the, the goal was to kind of try and, he was trying to make a period movie, even though we weren't openly saying it was supposed to be a period movie, but we wanted to capture, you know, the 80s, 90s, early aughts uh, of what Washington Heights still encompassed. Um, so when finding this and talking to, with the family, uh, the mother and father, uh, owners of the bodega have had it, you know, for 30 years. They, there was, I speak no Spanish, I'm, I'm, I'll be honest. It's a big regret in my life. I actually wish I did speak Spanish. I guess it's not too late to learn. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> but there, you know, there was a language barrier to have to conquer there. Fortunately, their son was sort of my age. And when I explained it to him, you know, there was hesitance for what I was explaining I wanted to do, which was essentially, I wanted to pay them money to close their business for, for a couple of weeks. And, and I tried to make it a substantial amount of money so that they wouldn't feel the, the pinch of that because it's very sensitive to the fact that if a local business has to close, you know, there's a bigger risk involved in that, which is when people see that their business is closed, they might go to somewhere else and then they might develop a, a loyalty to a different business. So I wanted to make sure that like, that that impact was lessened by incentivizing it. And so they, they got on board, they reluctantly, but they saw how it started unfolding. They saw how nice everybody was on our crew, my staff, and they, they, they bought into it hundred percent and they loved it. The problem ultimately with, we couldn't shoot inside of their bodega because what we wanted to do and what you see in the movie version that space is too small. And, and in general, in movie making, when we do interiors, our interiors are much larger than, uh, than what you perceive on the screen. 
So when you see somebody in an apartment or even this on a bodega in a movie, you think of it in, in real world terms where it's, you know, 200 square feet and it's really small. In reality, what we build on a stage ends up being like 3,000 square feet because we need all of this room to move the camera around and the lights around. And in the rule of thumb is you can always cheat smaller, but you can't cheat bigger. So we always definitely have to do that. We have to build something on, uh, on a stage. So we dressed it on the outside. We had our stage was an armory in Brooklyn. And, you know, an armory is 100,000 square feet. So we were able to kind of duplicate the bodega both inside and out and the other parts of the intersection so we could accomplish the interiors because none of the interiors you see, whether it's the bodega or the salon, were actually shot on location. Wow. Wow. So, so these are all, this, this, this is all, this is like offside. This is totally somewhere else in, in a studio. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. But there is also, you know, there's also a component of why we had to shoot on location for the exteriors that even though you see this set built this way, there's nothing that can replicate shooting on location in, on a real street. Yeah, I know, but also because you have, you, it's, it's going to be very hard to, I would imagine, to replicate the context with the people that you, you were showing, people playing domino in the corner, people walking by, and all that uh, ambience is, is kind of hard to replicate, I would imagine. This, this is good for a close-up. Um, um, so amazing, amazing. Um, th this is definitely a, a, a people's effort, uh, no, no doubt about it. It's really incredible. Um, the, the, how about the other place, the, the Rosario's uh, uh, car service, diagonal, this is amazing. Did you, did you have the same uh, uh, issue with getting to them? How, how did they react? Uh, it, Reno car service. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm blanking on the, the owner's name, the woman's name, but they were lovely top to bottom. I mean, you know, look, like everybody else, they were, they were kind of hesitant at first about what I was proposing. And even what I proposed originally was to not film on the inside. And then we had to switch gears and we decided we wanted to film on the inside. And somehow, I mean, cause it's, you know, it's a car service, right? So like, right. it's not like they say, okay, we're going to close up shop and stop, you know, sending cars around, especially in that part of Manhattan, everybody, it's not, it's not Uber world. Everybody relies on, on livery cars. So, you know, they have their list of, of clients that needed to be taken care of. So they, they bought it, they were on board and we managed to figure out a way where the days that we needed to film inside, they did the dispatch from their basement. They like rewired everything into like a little cellar room underneath the car service and kept doing dispatch. I mean, it's so fitting and part of the story, right? Like, you know, in our yes. story, the dispatch, dispatch doesn't even go down during a blackout. So yeah. it was like, there was no quit in them. And uh, honestly, they were a joy to work with, but it took it took some convincing, especially since we wanted to be inside where they work. Um, and we had to change over the space pretty significantly. We had to do a lot of things in there that were not, that's not how the inside of the car service looks. We added a lot of stuff to it, um, but well, it was very lucky that they were willing to participate. And it's amazing because, because I think to some extent, the movie, it's a story about... Um, not only survival, but also resiliency. Uh, and you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, keep, we're gonna go on. We're gonna go on. We have nothing. We have nowhere to go. We're here, but we're gonna, we gotta, we gotta move on. Bring it on, whatever it is. This is, this is the story of our lives. So we gotta. So resiliency is, it's, it's just, it's something that, that um, it's, it's, it's very prominent in, 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 in the movie as a way to speak of real people's lives and, and abilities and, and, and the skill sets that, that really define, you know, uh, the neighbors and, and, and the community. And keep, in, keep in mind that I'm, the movie hasn't been made, right? They haven't seen it. That's so they right. don't know what the final product is. So I'm, I'm selling them, a, I'm pitching them a dream essentially of what this is going to ultimately be. 
Uh, and I couldn't have been prouder of how it turned out because I feel like we really did it right. And we did it right by what was talked about and what was discussed and what we would do with their spaces. And we represented their spaces as best as we possibly could. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, um, great. Um, and I, I also thinking about what you said is, it's not just that you're affecting that space. It's like in the case of this card service, the livelihood of all of these car drivers and all these livery cards who depend on them being on and getting those phone calls and, and referrals. Uh, yes, because sometimes, you know, Uber cars don't go all the way up there. So it's, it's a different neighborhood. It's a different place. Just think about like who, who, who else, you know, downtown asked for a car service. This is something that happens in the outer boroughs or, or guess what? In the Heights, still, still the way people move around because those are reliable businesses that are there. And then just because Uber may not go all the way up there. So it's just not only the service, but all these drivers are amazing. And, that, and that's a big component too of what I do in general that I take on personally, which is no matter what the project is, ultimately, your impact, we are impacting people's lives. And I want to make sure that the impact is a net positive by the time that we're finished. Because every, like, I'm, an, I'm a New Yorker first. You know, I'm, I'm a filmmaker second. But at the end of the day, I still identify with regular people who live here because that's who I am. So I want to make sure that the same respect that I want for my neighborhood I want to afford that to everybody else whose neighborhood that I work with. Wow, um, amazing. I, I, there's this image on the, on the screen. I, I want us to talk about Daniela Salon, uh, uh, I, which I realize this is, this is just right in the diagonal to that. But I, when I saw this, this image, when I see this image, it really makes me think of you know, a, a place that could be whether in, in, in Queens or, or, or in Havana, La Calle Galeano, uh, or, or somewhere in, the, in, in San Juan perhaps, but in many places that I've seen this type of Art Deco-ish architecture that is just the total storefront uh, makeup uh, to, to, to a building. Um, and, and in this case, it's actually not original. This is all made up by, by, by you guys. How, how do you guys arrive to this, this kind of, you know, the, just re, redo and, and, and design of this kind of a, a setting here? Well, you know, and that was the thing. The, the ideal location actually was a salon, a bodega, and a car service all within proximity and visual proximity to each other. So, excuse me, the, the one caveat missing from this was a clear salon that would work. At the end of the day, I actually kind of chuckled to myself that we, we built a salon because I think the thing about, the thing that's always funny about Washington Heights is that it's got more parks than any other area of the city and it's got more salons and barbers than any other place in the city. So I thought it was a little crazy that we were ultimately building a facade of a salon, but it physically made sense for the geography and how everything would play out. Cause as you see in the ultimate story, there's so much physical interplay between the bodega and the salon and the characters needing to come out and interact with each other. It just had to be that way. So. I sort of sat back and waited for the designer to come up with what his idea would be for a facade. And we had spoken with the, the owner of the building. And what was actually a concern of mine, on the outside of the building, on the, the original facade, there was a sign. And this is like in the first days of seeing it. There was a sign that said for... Uh, it was a pre-K, uh, pre-K or or daycare. Like you see on the uh, on the lower level, there's a sign above. Oh, I see, I see, there. I see. It was a daycare, and so I was actually concerned that there was a, an operating daycare in there, which just it, it's more about logistics and, and overlapping. And she told us that they were gone, that it wasn't there, that the building essentially, you know, had some residents who lived there but that the daycare wouldn't be an issue. And so that if we wanted to come up with some wild plan to put a facade in front, as long as we were maintaining egress 
for people to get in and out of the building, they were all for it, putting up a facade. And so I just waited for what the design was and I showed it to her and I said, this is what we want to do. And she said, okay, it's great. Looks good. Oh, amazing. And, and, and what a fitting, what a fitting design to talk about, you know, the, the, the kind of almost mundane, uh, you know, not, not necessarily very sophisticated architecture that, but, but with, with character, uh, character nevertheless, that you find uh, uptown and, and uh, in the outer boroughs and, and so on. So very, very, very fitting. And, and I was delighted when I actually figured out that the whole thing was happening in the same corner and that was just really fake. But I was just like, what a great fake. This is, this is a good one. So, and then I think the other thing that's amazing about that intersection is, is just that. that the, the, so you have the high, the taller buildings, the taller apartment, multifamily apartment buildings, uh, where the bodega is below, and then there's a pharmacy, I think, then the, the, the car service. And then in this corner that you turn into Daniela Salon, but the, the corner is actually a row house block. Uh, and, and I think this is where Usnavi is, is living at the very beginning, the very beginning of the movie that he kind of like comes out uh, and go, goes out on the stoop and, like, and, and steps into into a piece of uh, chewing gum, he, this is where he's living. He's, so it, it was all so fitting and, and so telling about variety, diversity of different different uh, architectures and configurations and, and ty typology. So, so what, what, a, what a beautiful, what a beautiful uh, uh, spot. And, and I guess, you know, very fitting to, to have also that kind of more private, you know, residential like, um, um, that, that whole scene there is that they're, 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 they're shooting the the whole alabanza uh, scene to to la abuela I can imagine and it just it's just very very fitting to do that at a with a lower scale building um, than in well, a multi family. I actually um, this the script originally called for um, an apartment a uh, uh, abuela. Abuela's apartment should have, needed to be um, like three or four floors up and in one of those buildings where there's an inner courtyard to go inside, but it's not like a really a courtyard, it's just where the entrances are set back inside this waiting area, the uh, big wide open area. And, and I sort of kept saying to the director, um, I kept saying, wouldn't it make more physical sense if Abuela Claudia's was right there like that it, it, it just ties into the block so much better and for this especially for alabanza it just made more sense where you would have a dramatic more of a dramatic feel of the residents with candles coming up to the big window as opposed to it would be harder to kind of map them out and see it properly by flooding into that courtyard area of the apartment building and once they saw like how that made physical sense, that's how it, we ended up in that you know second house, third house down the way, and actually even built it out on the inside to make it look more of like an apartment. The inside of the house looked look more like a house. Wow. So we had kind of like built it out a little bit more to make it more of an apartment. And what you see on camera of them inside of Abuela Claudia is, is actually the real location just built out a little bit more. Well, and I, I love that because also what I think is also fascinating about the movie is the way in which the song lyrics and and the ambiences are 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 very intertwined. I mean the the song where Usnavi introduces at the very beginning the part of the song when he introduces Abuela, she said, like, this is Abuela. It's just, she's not really my Abuela, but she practically raised me. This corner was her, her escuela. He's pretty much saying that here in this place, this is where she did all of this. So the relationship between the house and the corner and with all the associations that the corner has, that is also with the businesses, it, it, it suggests some level of immediacy that I can't imagine that that the house will be anywhere else. It's, it's implicit in the song and the music that this is all happening in the place because it's, it's all very interrelated, so. And also this picture too that you're seeing right now is, to me, it's super important in general. This is a night that 
John's son was born and he mm -hmm. had to leave set. And the woman here in the foreground on the right at the at monitors is Kiara, is the writer. And she was given the opportunity to direct this scene that night. And I think it adds another layer of just trying to make this movie really by, about the community, by the community, because she also lived uh, up there as well. Wow. I mean, this, the, the movie, and, and as you, you presented, and with a lot of the images that we've seen, it's, it's, it's really a people's effort. Um, and, and, and that really, um, you know, it, it, it's very clear in, in the movie. Uh, itself, um, and 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 I wonder as you guys were putting this together, but also like want to see an image like that with that kind of background that to 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 me it reads as, as a very specific urban area. Like how much consciousness there was in in the preparation of all these scenes, and and really making sure that you you have both, um, and that kind of really well balanced between the city as a background, but the people are the center of the stage and, and one not necessarily overtaking the other. There's so many places that are about like what you see and the, pan, the panoramic views of certain skylines or so much. Here, the city is always a background. The blocks is always the background. You, you kind of know you are there. You know that it, it's all happening there and the people are always in the middle of it. Uh, so how much conversation about that there was in the whole uh, process? I mean, it was, it was integral. It was absolutely integral that, um, you know, the city's always going to be there, right? Like you say, like, it's always going to be the backdrop. You know, it, it, it's just about convincing landowners and shop owners and apartment owners what is, what's involved. But, um, you know, you can't, you don't want to just call up central casting and say, give me people to be in this movie. You, you want the community to feel like, they have ownership of it. So there were casting calls done in the neighborhood. There was open casting done in the neighborhood a lot. I know that um, there were a, a bunch of days, a handful of days, I think towards the end that Lynn was present for a lot of the casting. A lot of the people in these scenes, both in the intersection and at the pool were cast from the neighborhood. At the end of the day, one of the things that I said to um, all of the local leaders and politicians that I sat with was that we are making a concerted effort both to hire people both in front of the camera and behind the camera that are from the neighborhood. And so we even did, um, we did work, labor casting calls essentially, where we like had people come out from the neighborhood. I called on the local leaders to send me um, you know, young adults who were looking for a different career path opportunity and send them my way so we could have them entered in, you know, for being considered for jobs. At the end of the day, you know, I think when I had our accounting team break it out of the local spend, I know we spent a million dollars in this one little central area, but something like $400,000 of that was spent on local labor. That's amazing, that's amazing. So, so, so it's, it's something that at the end really had a, a positive impact on the community literally in terms of dollars and cents when people all of a sudden got a job just by being there. One, so, one yeah. of the things that I hear a bunch in, in filming in the city uh, is when I'm in a neighborhood, I hear some, somebody local to the neighborhood would say, did you hire anybody from here? Did you, did you have anybody from this neighborhood working on this job? And this project, more than any other project, was it important to be able to look people in the eye and say, 100% absolutely. You know, can't, can't exist for as long as we did in this neighborhood um, without having representation behind the camera. And, and, I, and I think it's just overall important too, because when other folks see themselves represented in front and behind the camera. They're seeing things they haven't normally been seeing and it gives them hope and the visual idea that anything is possible. And we want to encourage that. And we always want to encourage that when we're making these projects. 
Yeah, and, and, and also it's, it's so fitting because also, I think that's also part of how the movie touched me in, in the sense that it's, it's a movie that, that tells not one story, but many stories about people, people's um, backgrounds and, 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 and frustrations, but also hopes. The whole, the whole thing about El Sueñito, it's, it's about having a dream that one day something good's gonna happen, right? That's, that, that's, 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 that's just the whole movie is Usnavi telling that whole story to the kids, uh, that how, how he ended up there, what happened, what were his aspirations as a, as a I'm sorry if, I, if that's a spoiler, <laughs> probably, sorry for that. Um, uh, but anyway, if you haven't watched the movie, go watch it, it's really amazing. And doesn't matter if I said that. Um, it's, a, it's a story about like, it's about, about dreams and aspirations. So to, to, really, to really be able to, 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 to do that and operate that at the local level and really have people seeing themselves, not only be, be, being part of that, but being engaged and seeing themselves represented. It's also that, that definitely had the potential to be bigger and transcend the neighborhood. I think it's, 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 it's amazing. Well, and also, too, I mean, look, Washington Heights is magical still. I mean, it is, I think it actually might be the last sort of neighborhood in Manhattan or, or maybe the city at large that represents the immigrant resettlement in America and hasn't been fully gentrified and wiped out that you know, the original immigration to that neighborhood was uh, Russian, German, Polish Jews who were fleeing, you know, the war and prior to that coming to the neighborhood. And it's sort of in the 70s, the 60s, 70s, there's the Puerto Rican and Dominican diaspora of moving to that, relocating to that neighborhood. And it's still embodied there. And I think that the magic of that neighborhood is that it's still a very strong immigrant community that it's always been and there's still this hope that anything is possible that we associate with being an immigrant in this country and and, and i i just can't get over that to be honest with you about we don't have much of that left in the city a lot of these neighborhoods are getting replaced by you know gentrification and high rent and high purchase prices and that also was a concern about making this movie, that there was this um, concern that the impact and the effect of the success of the movie could ultimately potentially price people out. Um, I don't think that that has happened because um, I still think some people uh, can't see doing that commute from all the way up there, but you know that's their problem. If you're close to the A train, you it's not that big of a deal. It, it's, a straight, it's a straight shot. It's not, not that big of a deal. Um, amazing. I, I think I want to talk about something you said in relationship to this particular image that, that speaks about the scene in the movie that the in the, in the clip that we show at the very beginning of that song between uh, Benny and and, and Nina. And um, which is the issue that there is there's some sense of magic that there's something still kind of magical about this place and, and not in a condescending way but in a, in, a, in a way that is real that even relates to to the culture right uh you know i'm thinking about a little bit the magic of realism that we talk about in in central american literature and and the whole you know um uh uh, hundred years of solitude and so on, right? That there is something about the culture that is intrinsically that intrinsically has a magical realism component. That uh, I, I thought it was it was it was kind of uh, interesting and, and elegant the way it was actually um, uh, shown and in and, and this particular scene where. As they show in the video, they started talking that kind of in the middle of the firewall, obviously they're together, but then something happened and start walking on the, on the building and then they start walking on the facade. And it became this kind of magical realism moment where all of a sudden there was there was the magic of, of, of love uh, between them, but there was also the magic of the moment 
with the background of the bridge. Um, and I have to say for me, that was a very moving scene as well, because we're working on that building, just I think it's, it's a building 200 uh, Heaven Avenue, which is the building that had that view. This is a brick exposed building that then the bridge is just right there. So when I saw the view, I was just like, oh my goodness, I know exactly what this is. It. This is this is one of our projects, uh, incredible. Brick exposed building, not exactly like that, but I, I love how a lot of those components of the, the, the neighborhood were actually uh, very carefully, look at that image, very carefully uh, replicated and, 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 and played with to create this, this kind of magical moment to, to talk about people's dreams and, and, and aspirations and, and, and frustrations in, in a kind of magical way using the building as a background. Um, so I, I thought it was just, just amazing how all that came together. And, it, you know, I mean, that was a big, um, you know, obviously we couldn't do that gag uh, in the in the real world. Right. As you, saw right. It, you know, in the previous picture, it was a, a wall. We built the facade on the stage and that whole part that they're on, um, this object in the, in the left is called a techno crane and it's a camera crane that can extend outwards of 50 feet. I think some of them go to 75 or 100. Um, and so that was an integral component to shooting this because that wall was made by special effects so that uh, essentially when it, there's a certain point and I have a video somewhere of it um, of there's a cue and the wall starts tilting down. And so as the wall is tilting down, we're able to keep the camera static on that crane so you get that like dizzying effect that we saw in the video where that. all of a sudden they're standing up on the wall yet the camera hasn't moved at all um that was a a real that was a hard one to pull off i know oh. that they rehearsed that a lot that 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 piece alone you know was built took a long time to build it took a lot of a lot of effort and a lot of man days of labor to put it together um but when we saw it executed live it was just it was moving and it's it moving still, magical yeah. you see the you see the final product and i saw it i saw a cut of the movie at one point um like maybe in 20 i saw it in february of 2020 right before the world you know shut down and we were uh doing a couple days of reshoots and i saw it without like heavy vis effects you know put in and i was still moved at like the completion of it you know seeing it uh, a scene like that on a big screen we just don't we don't make things like that anymore we just don't it, it's it harkens back to a, a old school hollywood musicals and the gags that you know like uh I forget the name, Bus Busby Berkeley or, or something like that. The old musical uh, movies put together. This stuff is just, it's not done that much anymore. So to see it done and then to have it like witness it and then see the product. But also to hear, it's amazing to hear that it's actually, that it was actually shot like that, right? That is, you, you made the, the, the wall move as opposed to the entire thing be CGI that is just a, a fiction uh, uh, fake. This, this, this seems like the, the actors were there and then the wall move or the camera move, whatever. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's something that could have been done digitally in a very different manner. But I think, I think it's just amazing that you, okay, you could not do that there on, that, on the actual spot, but then you did it on the stage in a way that is still kind of real, so. When we talked about it in prep, and you know, with making these movies, one of the things that's the most difficult is to figure out how to spend the money and be responsible about spending the money because mm -hmm. everything costs a lot of money. And there was one point where John said in a straight, with a straight face in a, in a department head meeting, what if the wall moved? <laughs> And I think I think I heard the the producer's stomach drop. <laughs> you could actually physically hear him like get sick because he was like, "Oh no, what's that going to cost?" But you know, at the end of the day, whatever it cost, it cost. It, it ended up looking amazing. It was great. It was great. It's really, really, really incredible. Uh, I love that scene. It was very moving, very moving. So I'm, I'm glad that 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 was the one chosen for the 
the often enough our conversation today. Um, I, there's a, I want to ask you a few more questions. I, I wanted to talk about this, the, the Carnaval, what it may seem seen. Um, coming from the Caribbean, from, from, from Havana, uh, and knowing what a Carnaval is about, it's, it's really about being out on the street and having a big party and dancing, and there are carrozas, and people are having a good time, drinking, whatever. Um, and and this this scene, I, I thought it was just like a oh, really interesting thing, man. A carnival being celebrated in the middle of the street, like it really happens when it happens out there. Uh, they made it in the courtyard. So how do you? I, I understand that this is a very cinematic, you know, contained scene that that could have some benefits from from a, you know a movie making perspective. But I thought that that uh, it. It, it was an interesting show. So can, can you tell, tell why? Why un carnaval in, 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 a, in a courtyard? This uh, scene is, I mean, look, there's so many that are, are amazing, but this day I remember very, very well because this was almost eight pages of dialogue and singing that we shot in one day, which wow. is unheard of. Like, you don't do something like this in one day and somehow we managed to pull this off in one day. There's a, a group photo that I have of all the dancers that got together at the end that I, I couldn't share because of, you know, rights issues and stuff like that. But the sheer joy and elation that erupted at the end of this day, um, you know, Anthony Ramos leading this charge of like, he's waving the Dominican flag and everybody has got like, there was just this spontaneous joy of knowing, of yelling for the culture. I mean, this yeah. was, it was, this whole scene was for the culture. Um, in terms of picking the location and identifying the location, you know, it was described to me that, and when you read it in the script, you know, this is during the, the blackout. So mm -hmm. the power is out, everybody's hot, everybody's tired and sweaty. And we wanted to have this like, claustrophobic type of feeling where the walls are kind of closing in on you and there's so much pent up energy and power that you just want to blow the walls off and so that was the whole kind of you know uh, direction of what to look for and essentially look the most important thing about the majority of locations in this movie was that they take place in the neighborhood and we had a very finite amount of options that could fit this. This is over at a hundred between 176 and 177 in Haven. You know, this is over there tucked back in that area. In, <laughs> in the middle of the picture, you see the elevation uh, sort of of like how the one sidewalk is raised over the other. That looks, like looks like a fence that you took down. <laughs> It was a it was a property. That's a property line. So like one car, courtyard belongs to one building and the other belongs to the other. It's just a back area. So it's not normally wide open like this. There's a big there was a big fence that went through the middle. So we had to basically make a contract with both those buildings plus the buildings on each end. So it ends up being four or five buildings. Get them all to agree to us cutting down the fence, and then that's how you have this open cinematic area. It wasn't that way with the fence there. So ultimately, with the need to have it be, be tight and wanting to be local, this ended up being the most cinematic choice. And when I when I was sitting there watching it unfold, you know, it was like everything else. It's like I knew this was the right place for it. It just made total sense. Uh, and, uh, and it's an amazing scene. I mean, the music is amazing. They, they're, I was rooting for the, the moment when they, they would say, well, they, they talk about La Bandera Cubana. Uh, I was like, it's coming, man, it's coming. And, and they have all the flags there. It's, it's, a, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing scene, very, very moving. And you're right, it, the, the, it makes sense from a, from a movie making perspective because it really does create that kind of contained scene where, where here we are and where, where we got to kind of explode out of here and get out uh, uh, and go somewhere else. So, so, so uh, fascinating, fascinating. Uh, you know, um, 
the whole point of the song is that, you know, like, why are we wallowing in despair? We're, exactly. we're a, a music, fun-loving people. Like, we don't let something like this get us down. We don't let Abuela Claudia's death get us down. We don't mm-hmm. let the blackout get us down. Mm-hmm. We celebrate. We celebrate in the hardest times, no matter what. That's what we do. And that was the impetus to drive this, to, to push this kind of location for the scene. Because that's that's the experience of being an immigrant. Uh, that this is the immigrant experience. We we are gonna do well no matter what. You you can take it all. You know, um, we may even feel powerless, but we're still gonna have fun. We're still gonna have a good time. We're gonna make something out of this. So so very powerful. We get the job done. Exactly, immigrants. We get the job done. That's that's exactly right. That's exactly right. That, that's that's a, an amazing line from Hamilton. Love it. I, I also. I think that the, the movie is, is a great part of what I like to do. It's a great homage to, to New York in general. So it's not only it not only concentrates on, on in the neighborhood, but it also it always reminds you that even though you are in the neighborhood, you're in New York. So the, the, the constant presence or the, the, the frequent presence of the subway, the elevated, the elevator in, in both the lyrics and the visuals. Uh, the subway has a presence. She's Daniela is saying that you know. Next thing you know, I'm gonna take that 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 train and then that downtown train, and I'm gonna get out. The amazing scene uh, with Abuela Claudia asking her her mama, "What what am I gonna do, Mom? I'm telling the story of a Cuban immigrant who came to 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 the to the heights in the 1950s. Now she grew up there. All the things they had to go through, wash floors and so on. Now she's in this amazing moment. Like, what am I gonna do, Mom? Do I stay or go? Beautiful. Did you did you shoot all this? These are all subway, real subways in local subways. Did you? Can you talk about this subway component of the, the, the movie? So, all right. So there's a couple things to this because Paciente y Fe is, you know, like, I mean, it's like one of the home runs of the movie, right? And Incredible. there was this, there really was a debate in, in prep. Like I said, this ties back to the money part of it. There was this debate about, we need to figure out how to cut things in order to afford the things we want to do. And the one thing we kept, I kept hearing, we kept honing in on this actual set piece because yes, we did shoot this in, um, a, it's, a, it's a subsection of a train station in Sunset Park, um, 39th Street and 9th Avenue. And uh-huh. so this is an area that's not used by the public. Um, we brought in two trains, an A train that we, we know and love, and then a train from the 40s. Um, it was all of this like really heavy, and it's working with the MTA. I love the MTA. I have a great relationship with them. They have gone above and beyond for me. Every single time I've called on them, I, I, I absolutely adore and love the people I work with at the MTA. But you know what? It's expensive. It's, it's almost prohibitively expensive, especially when you're talking about bringing two trains onto a track. So in prep, there was this like mumbling, this murmur about potentially cutting this number. And one of the like second to last or third to last weeks, we had a table read. So we brought all the cast in and a table read for a musical is everybody sitting around in this room and singing the musical in a professional office setting. So the actors are all in, the, uh, in a box of, of tables and then all of us are sitting around them. And look, I'll be very honest. I'm not a musical guy. I've done three <laughs> musicals in my career. It's not me. I'm not the demo. I'm proud of the work I've done, but it's not for me. Mm-hmm. When Olga sang this song, myself and everybody else was crying by the time she was finished with it. You could not fight it. You couldn't. It was one of the more emotional experiences I've ever had in making a movie, especially in watching her perform this. She stood up at a table in a conference room, essentially, and sang this song as though she sang it in the movie. Mm-hmm. And the moment I saw that, I said, well, there goes the, there goes the idea of cutting this song from the movie. Yeah, <laughs> this, this is how to stay. You can't take that out. And when you see it, and it's this combination of almost everything you see on a subway, on the platform, that all takes place in this substation at 39th and 9th. 
but we also wanted to tie it to the tunnel at 191st Street between Broadway and St. Nicholas. And then into community engagement and community involvement, because if you've been in that tunnel, you know that that tunnel is an important conduit to get to the subway. That the reason the tunnel is there is to prevent the little abuelas from having to hike up a huge, stiff, uh, uh, steep cliff to get up to Broadway. It, it's, it's actually physically draining to walk up from St. Nick all the way up to Broadway or Broadway to St. Nick. I forget the geography. Right. It's just a, everything else, the topography up there is peaks and valleys. So it involves having to go to the community and really convince them that this was something that was worth their time, that we were going to take the tunnel offline starting at around 9 p.m. on a Friday night in, in the summer, and we were going to take it and we were going to use it until 7 a.m. the next morning, a Saturday morning. Wow. Do a lot of presentations to the neighborhood, to, commuter, to CB12. One of the things that I came up with that ended up being, I think, such a big success, uh, and I know that members of uh, CB12 came by and saw it, I told the community what I was going to do is I was going to rent party buses. <laughs> Three or four party buses and use those as a shuttle, essentially, to do round trips to take people up top so that they wouldn't have to walk up those hills. And so that was part of like, when I talked to you about community building and, and building trust community, uh -huh. it's you know, things like that that made people go, all right, I guess we can deal with one night of being inconvenienced if you know there's at least going to be some give and take here and the production is willing to assist us in the inconvenience. Um, I know, I know that that was so such a positive impact on the neighborhood in general that when the MTA came back to them and had these elevator proposals that they because you know everything is elevators for the subway stations up there and those those elevator shafts are eighty years old, hundred years old. They're they're they were falling apart. They needed to be repaired. They were in desperate need of new elevators and and new shafts. Mm -hmm. And that I put into place, the neighborhood then went back and said to the MTA, we'll be okay with it if you do exactly what that movie did. Uh, amazing. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Um, the, the other really um, uh, part that I, I love about it, and it really speaks about New York, is, is just not just the subway, uh, and the train, um, but also it's just the open spaces, right? And, and I think that um, how open spaces, it kind of speaks about how open spaces and public, specifically public spaces are extremely meaningful for uh, communities of color and where, where people in the summer not necessarily uh, um, have the opportunity or the resources to you know, go out on, on, on a trip and people kind of stay put. And, 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 and so I love how, you know, how, how much of a presence of in public spaces, uh, the High Bridge Pool uh, and, and that amazing uh, song of 96K um, uh, have. So can, can you talk a little bit about how, how you know, what, what kind of discussion do you guys had about you know, to what extent and what level of understanding there is that that the, the representation of, of public life in public spaces was a, a, an important uh, 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 event that, that needed to really be made into the movie as much as the corners. Yeah, you know, uh, the pool actually was never a part of the initial script. Ah. Um, it actually came about because I think Lynn may have shown John the pool at some point, or maybe showed him pictures. I was on my normal Christmas, you know, around Christmas time, New Year's, all film production people, we shut down for two weeks. We call it our Christmas hiatus. So I was on vacation on a beach in Jamaica. I got a call from the producer's assistant that said, John's really interested in the high bridge pool. What do you know? And then he said, Greg, I'm on a beach. I will let you know when I get back. 
Um, but wait, but and, wait, it's December, so the water, the, 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 the pool is closed at that time. Right, right, exactly. And and actually, I you know, I have so many pictures that are stashed all over the place and different hard drives and stuff like that. And, and I'm drowning in this current production that I'm prepping. But I, I had come across late last night, you know, one where we were standing in the pool where, I, I mean, it's, it's all empty. I mean, this used to be, Highbridge used to be the reservoir, right? The, that, that was bringing a lot of water to Manhattan. Um, so it got turned, I forget when it got turned over to a pool. I think it happened under the Great New Deal. You know, I think like when a lot of like old infrastructure projects were being turned into, you know, open space projects, I think in the 30s, it gets turned over into a pool. I kind of forget my history on that. Um, but it, it quickly became um, understood that open spaces are a very big part of local community life, especially Highbridge Pool in the summer at the height of it. You know, it is packed with hundreds, if not thousands of people. Uh, it is the local cool down spot. Um, and it was just, it became, it was important. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, Washington Heights and Inwood have more park space and open space per square mile than any other neighborhood in the city. So it was almost easy to say, we want to use parks uh, as an exterior component because they're just everywhere. We looked, we looked at some of the basketball courts that are, you know, tucked away up in the one eighties. You know, I actually, I never even knew that they were there. There's like, I think it's like one eighty six between St. Nick and Audubon. There was like a, a basketball court in the middle of the street. That's like a park. And we talked about that at first. What's actually surprising to me too is ultimately we never did anything in Fort Tryon Park. Uh, ah. but the park administrator of Washington Heights Inwood, she was so great. You know, we were able to work with her on J Hood Wright Park, which ultimately really is the park that's like the money shot. You know, the spot that the, the spot with the money shot view. I mean, you can you right. can't beat that one. You know? Yeah, right. And so it was just the first time we stood up there. It was just it was easy. It was a no brain. Like you, you walk up to that terrace and you, you just presented with the Hudson River and the branch. Yeah. And it was just, it was a no brain. Um, you're, you're in the hall. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, I mean, yeah, like you said, you know, parks and the outdoor life uh, up there is a very integral part to the way of life and existence in that neighborhood. And it was easy to say, like, I see these numbers happening here. Um, it wasn't, I don't, think it, I don't even think it was written as J Hood Wright Park. I think he wrote it as Bennett Park originally. Um, uh, and, and that's where I grew up. I grew up around Bennett Park. And it just, I took them there, but we knew it wasn't, it just wasn't cinematic enough. Like it just, it didn't work. But J Hood Wright and Highbridge Pool were just no brainers. And, uh, and I, can imagine, I can imagine where else you're going to shoot that, 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 that scene for 96,000. Like this, this is the place where you, 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 what it happens. I mean, and I love the scene. I love the way of things is introduced with, they're talking about, you know, if I win 96K, what do I do with it? And they're walking down, these guys walk, they're all walking down with the towels, you know, shirtless, they're going to the pool, you know where they're going. And then this thing happens. It's this another incredible magical moment that 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 everyone is all of a sudden dancing this this to this to this this lyrics of 90,000, like the, the miracle that it would be if all of a sudden anyone were to win ninety six thousand dollars and so on just what, what i can imagine um uh really you know where, where else would you shoot that with so many people and, and so horrible but then this this is the how do you do that do you have to close the pool and uh, i mean this is this is this this is also a very popular place so i can imagine that you were gonna tell people all right guys we're gonna close the pool get out we're gonna shoot, shoot this 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 song well, and I and I think I think this is another good thing that I could share with everybody here who's a New Yorker. You know, the Parks Department is really adamant um, that their space is for the public, 
Their space is not for private rental to take away and take offline from the public. The national parks also behave that way. You know, this is taxpayer funded property. So the option, there is no option to close the park from the public. It does not exist. So it became my job to convince the park administrator to open up the pool early for us before the season started. The pool opens, it, it, it culminates there at the same time that, that schools close because they want to give right. local kids the, the, the place to go to essentially be babysat. Like this is a version of babysitting in a way. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's no negotiation to be had about closing it once school has closed. So everything was about trying to get it open and prepared ahead of schedule. And it involved a lot of like engineering, hand wringing in a way, because like if there's issues, if there's cracks or anything like um, structural that the parks department needed to repair, that's the time window that they do all that stuff in that like six weeks of May, June, school typically gets out like the third or fourth week of June. So like that's their window. And, and I was just fingers crossed that it was going to work out and that there wasn't going to be a major issue to prevent it. And then on top of that, we had to, this is where I learned about the lifeguard union. I didn't even know that there's a lifeguard union, but this is how I learned the painful truth that there's a lifeguard union. And they hold a lot of power over these pools over any waterway in New York City, they ultimately could have been the ones that said, we're not gonna participate in this. We don't want anything to do with this. So that was another issue where I had to hope and slightly pray that they would say, okay, we're gonna do this, we'll be a part of it. And ultimately they, they did, they were there. You know, We paid them to be there and it all came together and we did it the week we did it the week before they were actually, or a week and a half before they actually were supposed to open. Um, we had rain delays. I think what you end up seeing as the final product in the movie, it looks like it's a perfectly hot, sunny summer day. Yes. Uh, the reality is, is that we had two of those days where we were dealing with a lot of rain delay. And I think we ended up having to do a fourth day shooting at the pool because we had lost time to weather. Um, but ultimately, you know, the magic of visual effects and, and editing, we were able to make it look like it was a hot summer day. That's a great place to spend the money in CGI, you know, make, make it a totally overcast day. It looked like it's like the, the, the middle of a hot summer day. I was just, I was like, did they close that movie? This, this is crazy, so. Incredible! Look, what a what a what a beautiful, uh, meaningful scene full of music and life, and it's it's chic, it's it's cute, but it's, it's also meaningful because it speaks about again dreams and aspirations. Um, uh, because this issue, the lottery, you know, it's it's, it's that's really what it comes down specifically in this this marginalized community, and, and it's where people have limited resources, and then really winning the lottery really all of a sudden really means a lot um, and, and it does happen every so often but but it, it kind of you know it creates that well, window of opportunity to you know the dreams of what 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 if so kudos on that um i, I think that there, there there are many other uh public spaces the parks the, the this this is an amazing spot um uh, on on the stairway the, this is at the end where the graffiti, the, the, the graffiti Pete, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's doing his thing and he, he stains um, 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 uh, Vanessa and she had that moment of illumination, that Eureka moment and say, oh, wait a minute, there's something I can do here, you know? But I love how street life, graffiti uh, tagging, all of a sudden made it into the story, not as a bad thing, but as a, as a positive thing, so just representing with, without making a big splash into it, I think uh, I, I, you, but you can read it, you could read into it that all of a sudden graffiti was good. Uh, graffiti was something that, that was conducive to creativity and, and positivity and, and, and a, a, a real game changer for her and, and allowing her to be where all of a sudden she 
she understood where she should be and what she could be doing, you know, with her personal self. Beautiful moment there um, as well. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, these stairs are also the 181st Street stairs. Uh, well, actually, 187th Street. And so, like, this was this was actually as close as I got to being um, to my home. My mother still lives up there. So like wow. that was also the really great thing about filming up there is that I was able to go have lunch with my mother on some days. You know, she lives in Castle Village and being that close to home really was meaningful. And, and these stairs too. I mean, like I grew up, I grew up on these stairs. So it it's nice to as an adult to marry the things you love with your job, with the things from your past of your childhood that kind of define who you become as an adult. Uh, and it was not was not lost on me for one second, uh, standing in a place like this and taking a picture of the stairs and being like, "We're making we're making uh, our movie in our neighborhood." Amazing that that what was it for you growing up in the Heights? What what what? You don't speak Spanish, you you but you you belong. You understand the the street dynamics. Do you what what was it for you? What was it like for you? I mean, you know, it's weird, right? Because like I'm a child of the '80s and I, you know, I'm I'm born in '82, and um, I grew up through all of what the '80s was in New York City. I, I look, I I was a chubby chubby kid with a jew fro and i was a target it was easy to get picked on um you know i held my own but at the same time it was the city taught me fast you know i became an adult by the time i was eight um living up there you learn how to stand up for yourself and how to you know stand on your own two feet um that neighborhood in particular that i grew up like I said to you earlier, it's different. You know, I mean, it's it's a different culture, a different way of life in that area of Washington Heights. Um, when I would go to Bennett Park and ride my bike around Bennett Park, all of the old immigrant um, Jews would be sitting there in their big black trench coats and black hats in the summer. Uh, and I remember that visibly, you know, we were members of the local congregation up there. Um, so it was, you know, it was, just, it was a different world, I mean, compared to like what Audubon Avenue is. Um, but even then, you know, growing up in the city, it's, it's different. You know, Washington Heights was my home, but also my parents pushed to get me into school downtown, you know, so I would have to take mass transit. You know, I actually wonder if parents do this now. I'm probably not. But like by the time I'm seven or eight, I'm taking the city bus to school downtown, not like a bus bus. Not my daughter. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's a totally different way of living, but I think like the neighborhood helps me like be okay with that. You know, just the, the kind of fast growing up. Um, unfortunately for high school, because of living in the city, um, high school wasn't, really necessarily an option i had had some like difficult times and it wasn't an option there were only three high schools that like you tried that everybody tried to apply for and ultimately my parents decided that rather than get lost in the grinder and my father had just gotten remarried and had um uh, i had my younger sister uh coming on the way my father decided that the best course of action was actually to leave the city for high school. Um, and so I got moved to Westchester. I got taken from a school of 1500 kids in my grade to a school with 84 kids in my grade. Um, and it totally had this, like, it was a good thing because it helped me see like different parts of the world in a way. Like I didn't grow up suburban. So I come in as the city kid into suburbia and I'm still maintaining my headspace as a city kid, but I'm now in suburbia. And right. then at the same time, my mother didn't fully leave the neighborhood because 
the suburbs wasn't for her. So she had luckily had bought her place back in the Mm eighties when you could actually afford to buy stuff on a social worker's salary. And she never gave up that apartment. And it was, we'll go to, we'll go to Westchester, but I'm going to come back once you're done. And so she's been there ever since, you know, she left for four years and came back and she's been, and then as a young adult, you know, while I was getting on my own feet and trying to figure out how I was going to make money and, and live, live in this city, Mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough that she was a, you know, she offered me the chance to be able to stay at home. And so, you know, in my twenties, I live up there in Washington Heights and, and as a, you know, that adult, I got to experience the neighborhood again. You know, I don't, I didn't eat at Malacone as much as I did as a kid, but in my mm-hmm. 20s, I've been there all the time. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, and again, it's just, it's, 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 that's part of what the movie is trying to talk about. Like how, when there is a, when there is a, when there is, if, if the place goes away and then people cannot stay and people have to go, all of these stories are the ones that are also gone and then there's a tremendous uh, loss. So, so it's, it's really incredible. Um, I want to make a comment about um, the, another a final comment about the, the, uh, the high bridge pool that you, you mentioned and in the interest of time, I think I, I, we kind of have to wrap it up soon, but I, I want to say that, um, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a 1930s uh, complex, uh, 1934, uh, 1936, the, when the bathhouse, as it's known formally, was built. Um, and the reason why I know all this is because it's one of the few designated landmarks that there are uh, in, in, in Washington Heights. And I think part of the, 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 the question is that I would want to pose is, when you look at those maps, for instance, here's the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission, and it shows you historic districts throughout the city and, and look at the picture on the right, and other than the pool and the park and High Bridge Park, there, there are really no, not a lot of landmarks in, 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 in Washington Heights. And, you know, the Historic District Council, this, this is a lot of what they do, and this is a lot of what they get to deal with. Like, how do you really make uh, neighborhoods and how do you protect neighborhoods through uh, designation and, and, and working with communities in, in, in achieving that level of protection and so on. So I guess just to wrap it up with a more, more, more landmark specific question, which is part of what we do, does this map surprise you that, that there are so many other communities downtown, even in Harlem? I mean, they, they, Washington Heights has even less historic districts or, or areas that are really designated as a district than, than even Harlem, where, where I get to do a lot of preservation advocacy just to try to raise awareness about the need for, for increased landmark protections through what I get to work on uh, with Save Harlem now and many, 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 many friends and colleagues out there. But, but does it surprise you that, that um, there, there, there are no historic districts in, in, in Washington Heights? Um, do, do you think that there should be one? What, what do you think? Yes and no. I mean, you know, I think, I think from my understanding of LPC is that you're trying to maintain the historical integrity of a structure. And I think that a lot of these structures up there have over the decades gone through so many different changes, whether it's the facade or the interior, that I think makes it a little more difficult. There's also, there's also sort of the, the nasty thing about real estate where I don't think a lot of the landlords that are up there are regarded as the good landlords. And I know that those are the types that don't necessarily that fight to get that file and, and that they try to like make sure that it, it doesn't get preserved because they want to be able to do whatever they feel they should be able to do to a property. Um, it's just, I, it's tricky, right? I, I do think there's good and bad to LPC and the things that they determine to be protected. I think we obviously historically know of the big, big buildings that have been wiped out in the city because they weren't protected mm-hmm. by the LPC. Um, but this 
neighborhood, it, it should have, a I think, a designation. I just don't know what you designate. I don't know wh which areas of this you designate because I also do think that some there's some residents that might not be able to actually afford to do what's necessary under the landmarks rules of when you need to like refurbish a property and even do something as simple as stairs facade work or something like that. It, it's a it's a fine balance, right? It, it, it's just yeah, it is. It is. It is. But that's also that's also been part of the myth for too long that 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 uh, that has been promulgated by, by, by some the idea that land market, it just makes things more expensive. Yes, to some extent, but also to the extent that it also forces you to do something that is appropriate and, and, and that allows you to really do something that that is fitting and suitable to the building and to the neighborhood. So otherwise, you know, you 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 get what was happening in Harlem, where there's all these many other places that have been designated. Gentrification is just hitting. People are coming in and making whatever changes they want. So it's it's really a a, a, a control mechanism. For me, the question is more: um, what it, what if you what is what is it that you're trying to des to designate and to protect? And is it right. is it just the building? But is it the culture? Like, like, to what extent you can designate El Sueñito, uh, um, those gnarly stream, and 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 the, the spirit of the place in the people, uh, uh, and the, the way that people carry those stories of coming from somewhere else, and 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 that kind of intangible, we call that intangible heritage. That that, in my opinion, is it's so vivid here. It's it's so incredible, and and I think. Uh, look, you and I, when, we don't have to solve that, but I thought it was a really important uh, piece to, to kind of uh, end the conversation on, that there is this, this distinctive issue about what HCC is about, that at the end of the day, it poses a question, you know, to what extent there should be uh, a, a, a Washington Heights historic district, so that, that it may be worth it, and maybe the boundaries have to be determined, but hopefully one day we'll have a big carnival party right in the middle of 175th Street and Alton Avenue to celebrate some level of, of cultural recognition. Because I think this is also what I love about the movie that is really claiming for recognition. We're here, we're part of the, we're part of the American story. This is this is all about the American story. We we well, the, the the songs and the one of the pieces of the lyrics that says. We came here to live and work, right? That that is the quintessential American story. We came here to live and work, but that's not being recognized uh, to the level that it should. And I think that's one of the things that the movie uh, does to a great extent. Um, so um, hopefully, I mean, and I'm in uh, you know total agreement with you about a, a designation to protect the the community because it, it does actually as even as I described before about the hodgepodge of architecture that's there, that's its identity, right? And that, and that needs to be protected, that the neighborhood was built up by immigrants and everybody had a different idea of, you know, what is a dwelling and that that should fall into a, a district that protects that. And I, I, you've made me see the light a little bit more on that. Well, that's that's a lot of what I think is really fascinating about this this whole business of preservation. That it's a lot to talk about and to think about, and 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 there's a lot that goes into it. But uh, I want to be respectful of people's time. I think we've gone way beyond the hour that we we planned for. But I I, I can. I can keep going on and on, but I want to be respectful of, of your time and everyone's time as well. And, uh, and I want to really thank you. Thank you so much for your work uh, uh, and, and, and for uh, your, your um, for agreeing to spend this hour and a half with, with us and for sharing your, your, your thoughts and experience about the movie. And uh, uh, you, you've been a wonderful guest and I, I really have no way to, to, to thank you. So really, really appreciate it. And, and thank you for having me. I very much enjoyed this conversation with you. Uh, I hope we can do it again for future projects. Um, right. It was really a lot of fun and I'm glad we got to take this trip down memory lane to talk about the movie. I really appreciate it.
Great, and I count on you to, to bring in Lee Manuel and everybody else for a, a big carnival uh, celebrating uh, uh, some kind of cultural designation. <laughs> Thank you so much for everyone who attended. Thank you, Samson and Angel. Uh, this was a really wonderful talk and uh, everyone who attended, remember to check our YouTube channel. We're gonna upload this conversation and we also have some of our previous conversations on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much again, and I hope to see you all in a future opportunity. Ciao, hasta luego. Thank you. Uh,